guys. Um, I believe God wanted me to come on here today on the Sabbath, the seventh day, um, to talk about the concept of rest and what 666 really means. Um, and I have never been one to really focus on 666 or um, to really have like a burning interest in, um, you know, that name, name of the beast that's mentioned in the book of, Re of Revelation. Um, so I've, it really is like over the past week, it's it's been um, just repeatedly like brought to mind um, this concept of 666 and what that means and then also what it means to attain real and lasting rest. Um, so before we begin, I want everyone to just pause and think about the last time that they were that you've been able to really truly rest like feel really rested your inner person like a deep rest um so what came to mind um immediately with this this name that's mentioned in the book of, of revelation the name 666 um was this phrase work 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 always working but never feeling rested always working but never entering his holy rest on the seventh day um so god created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh and then he also instructed his children that they should also rest on the seventh day um, and just how important that is to 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 trust him enough to really rest from all of our striving like if we really truly trusted god then we would rest from all striving one day of the week and just sit um, and Jesus called himself the Lord of Sabbath, the Lord of Shabbat. Um, so I'm just going to, I did some research on, on what the word Shabbat or Sabbath really means. Like when it's broken down, um, what are the roots of the words and what, what do they really mean? And some of the notes that I took was that it meant to turn or return to a more fruitful way of life, hence to restore, to sit. Jesus, as we know, said that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Whenever he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. He rested from his work, and through Jesus only can we truly enter a deep, holy, inner person, eternal rest from all of our work and all of our striving. Um, and it's also one of the interesting, um, when, it, when the word's actually broken down, one of the interesting meanings that, that, that I found was that uh, it said captives moved captives being moved it's not the static position of being imprisoned but of the but of being moved and we know that the scripture says he set the captives free he moved the captives he set them free um and that it means restoration a sudden change of destiny a sudden change of destiny whenever we come to faith in jesus christ um we have a sudden sudden change of destiny um it's as if our our whole past present future has been redeemed um wiped clean and then set immediately on a new trajectory to life to rest um so i'm going to reference from the book of revelation it's and i'm just going to read what 666 means um but the mark on the right hand or on his forehead, preventing anyone from buying or selling unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast, or the number of its name, 666. This is where wisdom is needed. Those who understand should count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a person, and its number is 666. Um, and I believe that the devil chose that name, 666, to just kind of mock God, 
to mock us. It's, it's irony. It's, um, God worked for six days and he rested on the seventh. Apart from God, apart from Jesus, Jesus is the only name by which we are saved. He is the only door to the Father. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's the one who has given us the gift of salvation. Only by Jesus can we enter the rest of God. Um, and the enemy would choose a number, 666, to basically say that we will work, work, work but never enter the rest. Um, and what also came to mind this last week was the words that were placed um, over the gate of Auschwitz, the concentration camp. It said, it said, Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes one free. And that's what the devil would have you believe. If you work hard enough, if you do enough good things, then your afterlife, whatever that means, I know a lot of people out there don't believe yet. So, you know, we all have ideas, we all have beliefs, um, some true and some false, of what the afterlife will look like. And a lot of people, um, unbelievers, believe, well, if I live a good enough life, if I do enough good things, um, then I'll be all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. Um, and then those who believe in reincarnation, it's like, well, if you perform, if you work, if you do enough good things, um, then, then you'll earn a, a good enough status to um, come back in the next life as something better or not so bad. Um, but above the concentration camp, it said, work makes one free. But this is from the father of lies, the deceiver, the, the destroyer, because truth is only Jesus. Um, only Jesus makes us free. Um, this lie, and I found this from um, a documentary that I just watched. It's super short, but it's from the, the Holocaust Museum. Um, and I'll put the link underneath um, in the description below. But it references that this work makes one free, Arbeit macht frei, is actually the title of an 1873 German novel, um, which proclaimed the power of honest labor to rehabilitate criminals. But most that were in the concentration camp were not criminals, but men, women, and children. And it wasn't for what they had done. It was because of who they were. Um, the enemy was totally the orchestrator, the schemer behind the Holocaust. Um, and he didn't attack people based on what they did. He attacked people because of who they were. The enemy hates the fact that humanity bears the image and likeness of God. We are made, we are the only part of creation that bears the image and likeness of God. We are, the, we are God's children and God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that eternal rest and salvation would be a gift, a free gift but the enemy hates that. He wants us on that hamster wheel. He wants us completely just, yeah, I think a hamster wheel is, is a good description. Um, so the enemy hates, I'm just going to read this so I don't miss anything. He hates that we bear the image and likeness of God. And he hated the fact that the, that the Jews were his chosen people. Um, and after Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he became the light of the nations for the Jews and the Gentiles, both of us. And so the enemy goes out of his way to really um, attack what God cherishes and calls his own. Um, but the enemy would like to see us stay on the hamster wheel, running toward that mirage, which in the heat of the desert lies before you. Just try harder. You don't need God. Just work harder. Just work, work, work. Why do you think... He used 666, 666 instead of any other day that God worked and created on. He could have used the numbers 444 or 111, the other work days. But instead, apart from God's rest and salvation in Jesus, he keeps you worn out on the sixth, on the sixth day for all eternity, exhausted when you are most tired and most on the edge for real rest. 
He wants you tired. He wants you exhausted. He wants you unable to rest, unable to feel right, to feel truly aligned with the heart of God. I know what it feels like to feel like something deep in your gut just doesn't sit right. You have that anxious ball in your stomach that something does not feel right. And that, my friend, is a gift because when you feel that something's not right, I'm not able to rest, I'm not able to relax, I feel anxious, something in me, it doesn't feel aligned. That is your inner person crying out for their creator to be in right standing with God, to be able to rest in God's presence. Um, I'm going to just read from the book of Hebrews, some of chapter 3 and 4. I encourage you guys to just read the whole book of Hebrews because um, it's really, really good. But I'm just going to read this. On that day in the wilderness, this is starting with verse 9. When you put God to the test, yes, your fathers put me to the test. They challenged me and they saw my work for 40 years. Therefore, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not understood how I do things. In my anger, I swore that they would not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers, so that you will not be in, in any one of you an evil heart lacking trust which could lead you to apostatize from the living God. Instead, keep exhorting each other every day, as long as it is called today, so that no one will become hardened by the deceit of sin. For we have become sharers in the Messiah, sharers in Jesus, provided, however, that we hold firmly to the conviction we began with right through until the goal is reached. Now where it says, today if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the bitter quarrel who were the people who, after they heard, quarreled so bitterly, all of those whom Moses brought out of Egypt and with whom was God disgusted for 40 years, those who sinned, yes, they fell dead in the wilderness, and to whom was it that he swore that they would not enter his rest in the promised land? Um, those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of lack of trust. So the key here is to truly just trust God. That's that's the key. Um, righteousness is attained through ter through trust, through trust in what Jesus did for us, that it is enough to pay for our sins. It is enough to make us right with God. It is enough to attain eternal salvation, to enter into the promised land, to achieve real rest. We need to trust in that because that is the key. Um, and then I want to reference why trust is so important in Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy and loves us with such intense love that even when we were dead because of our acts of obedience, he brought us to life along with the Messiah. It is by grace that you have been delivered. That is, God raised us up with the Messiah Jesus, Yeshua, and seated us with him in heaven seated being seated means that it is finished that we can sit with our father because it is finished we can rest because of what jesus worked for us in order to exhibit in the ages to come how infinitely rich is his grace how great is his kindness toward toward us who are united with the messiah jesus for you have been delivered by grace through trusting and even this is not your accomplishment, but God's gift, it is not by our own accomplishments. You were not delivered by your own actions. Therefore, no one should boast, for we are of God's making, created in union with the Messiah Jesus for a life of good actions already prepared by God for us to do. So it is through trusting in Jesus that we have eternal salvation and eternal rest rest in this life and rest in when we're in heaven um, and what does that look like when we're in heaven i'm gonna read from the book of revelation chapter 7 starting with verse 15 that is why they are before 
God's throne, the why is that we have washed our robes, made, made them white with the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus. Day and night they serve him in his temple and the one who sits on the throne who will put his Shekinah, his glory, upon them. They will never again be hungry. They will never again be thirsty. The sun will not beat down on them, nor will any burning heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them, will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. That's what kind of rest I mean. I'm going to read from Psalm 23 as well. This is the kind of rest that he talks about, um, the eternal rest, the real deep inner person rest. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He has me lie down in grassy pastures. He leads me by quiet water. He restores my inner person. He guides me in right paths for the sake of his own name. Even if I pass through death-dark ravines, I will fear no disaster for you are with me. Your rod and staff reassure me. You prepare a table for me even as my enemies watch. You anoint my head with oil from an overflowing cup. Goodness and grace will pursue me every day of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord for years and years to come. He restores my inner person. He has me lie down in grassy pastures and he leads me by quiet water. And that is a gift from the throne of God. We can be confident in that. So I encourage everyone to just draw near to Jesus right where you are. Reach out for him. It is only by him that we can have salvation and enter rest. And the enemy whose name is 666, or that's the number of his name that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, would have you always and eternally living on the sixth day, exhausted, working, working for your own peace of mind, for your own definition of salvation, for your own definition of the afterlife. He would have you work to create your own identity. He would have you work to feel like you're never good enough, like you never measure up. He would have you forever working. But don't buy that lie, because he is a liar. The father of lies, Jesus says, instead trust and enter into the seventh day, the day of rest. All right. Be blessed and have a good weekend.